Since the beginning of time, God has been pursuing mankind. His pursuit is steadfast and unwavering. His love is resolute and unmatched. From the moment of our first breath, we have all been searching for hope. In every human heart, there is a longing for true purpose and meaning. There is a sense that we were meant for more. Our city is filled with people searching for truth, searching for answers. These answers can't be found in quick fixes, self-help books, or our limited ability to understand the meaning of life. Eternity is within us. The kingdom of God isn't a place, it's a people who are pursued by their creator and are found in the midst of their searching. You see, where the pursuit of God and the searching of mankind collide, there is Jesus. The bridge to the one true God, Jesus. The beginning and the end, Jesus. The perfect example of perfect love, Jesus. The one who loves us in spite of our failures, takes our worst and gives us his best, Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life, the one who broke the chains of our sin, the one who has the power to heal and restore, the one who defeated death and rose victorious on the third day, Jesus. No other name is higher, no other name is greater, no other name than the one we celebrate today, Jesus. Welcome in, guys. Welcome in. I just want to take a moment and I want to reflect on what we've been studying for anybody that might not have been here. But to reflect for a moment of what we've been looking at in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet, along with other Jews, were living as exiled captives in uh, Babylon. And the Lord God Almighty had selected Ezekiel as his prophet. And besides giving his prophet messages regarding the present and future conditions of the nation of Judah, specifically the political, um, the religious, and the moral climate of the capital city of Jerusalem, the Lord had information to tell the people living in exile. Amen. So we begin this chapter of 14, noticing that the elders of Israel have come to Ezekiel wanting to hear about any new information from the Holy Yahweh um, that hadn't been revealed yet. And they're going to find out that that message is going to be about them. Amen. The chapter 14 is going to be about those that are in exile here in Babylon. And we're going to just kick it right off. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3. So I hope that you have your Bibles with you because you're in a Bible study. You should have the Word of God in front of you. You should be holding me accountable for what I'm teaching. And you should be looking at the Word and saying, you know what? This pastor is reading it word for word. Um, we can go right here with him. So let's look at this. 1 through 3. It says, now some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into inequity. Should I let myself be inquired of at all by them? Now, there's a good question I want to ask you as we get started here with Ezekiel 14. And that question is, why is God talking to the people in Babylon? Why is God talking to the people in Babylon? I mean, really, after all, these people are hundreds and hundreds of miles away living in captivity. Amen. Haven't they already gone through the price or the penalty of their sins? Haven't they gone through the price and the penalty of their sins as we've seen? And, and it's probably sure that the Jews living in Jerusalem need to be punished. So why keep harping to us about what they're doing. Why keep harping to us what they're doing? You see, it was Ezekiel's responsibility to let the people living in exile know that they shared the condemnation of Jerusalem because of their continued sinful ways. You can take the people away from the sin that they developed in the Holy Land, but you can't take the sin away from the heart that desires to keep on sinning. And that goes for us today as well. That really goes for us today as well. You can take yourself out of a sinful situation, but it doesn't stop you from sinning. 
You know, there was a saying that I used to say before I came to the cross, and I'm not going to say it. But the saying, well, I was going to say it. I'll just clean it up a little bit. There was a saying that you can take the garden tool, right, and turn her into a wife. Okay? But you can't take the wife and turn her into a garden tool. Okay? You can remove all the sin situations from your life. You can remove all the sin situations from your life and still be in sin. Geographic changes doesn't revolve or relieve problems. Have you ever known somebody that said, you know what, I'm going to to move away because I need to get away from this situation. I need to get out of this environment. I need to get out of what's going on here. And then you stay in contact with them and you find out they're doing the same thing in the new city that they're living in that they were doing in the city they were in before. See, you can take someone out of an area And they can go to the new area and continue to do the same actions that they did before. Geographic changes or relocations don't don't relieve problems. And the major issue that we have been talking about is idolatry. There was really no difference from those who were still in Jerusalem and those living elsewhere. They both practiced idolatry. I want you to notice that some, some, not all of the elders came to Ezekiel to hear a message from the Lord. See, our Holy Lord God Almighty is all-knowing. Do we not realize that he not only knows our thoughts, but he also knows the motivations behind the thoughts? See, you can fool me. You can fool your mom. You can fool your dad. You can fool your friends. You can fool your church. But one person you're not going to fool is God. Because God knows the motivation behind your thought. You see, this is why he's called the wonderful counselor in the book of Isaiah. The holy God looked upon these Jewish leaders and knew that their hearts were not sold out for him. He knew by looking at their hearts that they were putting on a facade, that they were building a plaster wall, that they were setting up a fakeness before him, and he already knew it because he was looking at the heart of them and not the outward expression of them. Oh, come on. See, there's so many people today playing church. There's so many people today acting like they love God. They're trying to put on a facade so that they can fit in somewhere. But see, God already knows. God already knows. They, God knew that these Jewish leaders... We're not sold out for him. The the Bible describes them as double-minded. Double-minded. You see, the book of 1 Kings mentions this type of behavior. In 1 Kings chapter 21, it says, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. You see, Jesus gave us great insight. Jesus gave us great insight in how to act as listed in the gospel of Matthew 24. Giving grace, you got to get out of my notes now. You got to get out of my notes. In Matthew 24... He says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You know, the Bible's full of little golden nuggets. 
the Bible is full of little golden nuggets. If you go dig in in the word, you're going to find these golden nuggets. And these golden nuggets are going to enrich your life. Because these golden nuggets of wisdom are given to us by our Lord's half-brother, James, as he gives us instructions as guided by the Holy Ghost. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You see, they made the, 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 the only holy living God's advice as one among others. Here's a big sin. You want to know what a big sin is? Compromise. Compromise is a big sin. They believed in God to a certain extent, but they wanted information from a variety of sources, including from sources in the enemy's land where they were being held as captives. There's so many people today, there's so many people today that are still looking for answers everywhere but the one that has them. They're looking for answers in the book of Enoch. They're looking for answers in the book of Maccabees. They're looking for answers in the book of the Garden of Seas. They're looking for the answers outside of the word of God, the authorized word of God. They're going to other sources. They're going to other people. They're going to other areas, and they're looking for answers and not receiving the correct response. You see, it says stumble into inequity, stumble into inequity. What that well, that's a very powerful statement, isn't it? The few words have a major impact in its message. You see, it refers to starting out with what seems as something small and harmless. I could bring up a whole slew of examples, but let me just list one and I hope you catch the drift of its impact. You ready? Here's an example for you. You go to a Christmas party and someone offers you a little wine and ginger ale. This can lead to a future social event where you have where you are brave enough to order a mild type of wine by itself, not knowing how it all started. You are not drinking alcohol every day and you're getting drunk much much of the time. What started off so small and harmless has now taken over your whole life. So too is messing around with what seems harmless, like going to a fortune teller at some fair or playing with demonic games such as the Ouija board on Halloween. It can turn into a life riddled with evil and harm. You see, you wind up getting involved in this seemingly innocent item or this seemingly innocent act, and it causes you to stumble into future willful sins. Well, it's not too bad. It's just a drink every now and then. It's not too bad. My wife won't mind. It's not too bad. Nobody's going to see me. It's not too bad. And eventually, you're not too bad. It starts to be a not too bad multiple times a day. You see... The more you take the time to just meditate on his word, the more you're going to see his mercy and grace towards you. And boy, is he amazing. He knows our evil hearts, but loves us just the same. He knows our evil hearts, but he loves us just the same. Look at this great information about this point that is given to us by our Lord in Psalm 139. Look at Psalm 139. It says, I, O Lord, 
You have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Now watch this as a behavior and addiction counselor. Watch this as a prior addict. Watch this because we're all looking for that high. We're all looking for that high. Now watch. Watch what David says here. He says, it is high and I cannot attain it. It's a high And I cannot attain it. Jesus is such a high that nothing else comes close to the high that you receive from Jesus Christ. I don't care how many rocks you've smoked. I don't care how many lines you've snorted. I don't care what you've injected. I don't care what you've swallowed. There is no high that comes close to the high that you get from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Somebody better give him praise tonight. There's no high out there. There's no good feeling out there that matches up with what God has for you when you come to him. There's no high out there that can even align with it when you come into the presence of God. Hallelujah. And here, he's getting ready to bring the hammer of judgment down on the residents of Jerusalem. And a bunch of hypocrites come in false humility and seek his counsel. He asked his prophet, should I, should I be inquired of at all by them? You see, they think that they can approach the only real and living God with all their garbage, and they think they they could have come and received the word that he has for them. Psalm 66, 18 tells us this. He says, "If, if I regard inequity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Did you just hear what I said? If I regard inequity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. These are things that the Jews should have knew at this time. Look at me, verse 4 and verse 5 of Ezekiel 14. It says, therefore, speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord God, everyone of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart, and puts before him what causes him to stumble into inequity, and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols, that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart, because they are all estranged from me by their idols. There's a major point the Lord's making here. And the point the Lord states here, I use in my counseling sessions. And what I tell a person or a couple is this. And and there's people in here that I have personal relationships with. And they'll tell you. He's going to tell you the truth right now. Because he speaks to us this way and we're not even his patients. Now watch. This is what I tell them. Do you want me to sugarcoat my response? Or do you want me to tell you straight up what I perceive is the problem? See, here's here's the problem. Most of you want to be sugar-coated. Most of you want that feel-good pat on your back, oh, it's going to be okay message. But you need the facts. You need the truth. And it needs to be brought to you straightforward. It needs to be brought to you straightforward. And God here, he's informing Ezekiel to tell the elders that he would not pretend that everything was well. They would receive a straight answer on everything as it really was. He was going to reveal to them exactly what evil the hearts and minds were playing with as stated. According to the multitude of his idols. 
He says, do you want me to answer? I'll give you an answer. They, were, they would hear and experience the practical consequences of their disbelief and disobedience. Their sin of idolatry not only included other false gods, but added immorality. God was going to seize the house of Israel by their heart. There's an old statement that says, much more is caught than taught. From allowing the full measure of the evil that was thought and acted upon, the lesson learned after the sin had run its course would hopefully lead Israel back to repentance. Well, how do you know that, Pastor Nate? Well, let's look at verses 6 through 8 and watch this. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent. Turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. For anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into inequity, then comes to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself and I will set my face against that man and make him a sign and a proverb and I will cut him off from the midst of my people. Then you shall know that I am the Lord he didn't say the prophet was going to answer him God said I'll answer them myself uh oh you know I look at the Bible quite a bit and I don't know about you but sometimes I when I look at it I wonder why there's is there so much repetition in the Bible it seems like you read one chapter and then you read in another chapter basically the same thing. The Lord, however, is faithful and I thank him for the repetition. If you wanted to break up cement, how do you do that? If you wanted to break up a patio of cement, how do you do it? Do you just hit the concrete one time? A jackhammer. And what's a jackhammer do? Does it hit just the concrete one time? I don't think so. You have to keep whacking at it, right? You have to keep whacking at it until you crack through. Do you see the same thing here? Do you see the same thing in the word of God? See, our hearts are hardened. Our hearts are of the flesh. Our hearts are not of the spirit, right? So God has to keep using a jackhammer. He has to keep repeating his messages. He has to keep giving it so that he can break through the hardness of the heart. Come on. Give him praise tonight. Our Lord keeps using the same repetition over and over again until he can break through the hard surface of our sinful pursuits. Our idolatry takes on many forms today. And I'm going to give you some examples of the forms of idolatry that's very rampant today. Sex. Money. Education. Work, drugs, etc., etc. Anything you put before God for your pleasure is an idol. You see, the answer comes from Him, and it's to repent and come back to His loving care. But see, the people were doing the same thing we do. They want to continue to do the evil that they're involved in and still try to come to God for help. Let me repeat that because somebody needs to hear it. They want to continue to do the evil that they're involved in and still try to come to God for help. You say, well, that, that can't be true, Pastor Nate. 
that can't be true. Well, let me give you a little bit of my counseling side. I'm a Christian counselor. Because I see this all the time in counseling. People are pulling all kinds of sinful acts in their lives. They're going to psychiatrists. They're going to psychologists for help. They're taking drugs. I mean, sorry, medication to relieve the pain, even to the extent of increasing the dosage, and it still isn't working. Then they show up at church wanting God to make it all better. I'm not trying to be harsh tonight. I'm really not trying to be harsh tonight. But all they have to do is right in front of them. You point out the truth, but they do not want to repent and stop doing the evil. They have excuses for everything. They have excuses for everything. Lord, have mercy on us tonight. Help us to get the strength to turn around. Because the people of Israel, like us, sought out the prophet to try to justify our actions. The people of Israel sought out the prophets, just like us, to try to justify their actions. And let me let you in on a little secret tonight. You know, this isn't a good feeling message right now because I believe a lot of people are going to feel convicted after hearing this. Israel, along with us, is not going to like the answer that they get from God. You're not going to like the answer that you get from God because he says that he sets his face against us. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean that God has set his face against us? Here you go. Have you ever felt? Have you ever felt like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling? Do you feel like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling sometimes? Do you feel like sometimes God has abandoned you? If you have, you know the feeling. And God lets us know in such ways for us to come and know that things are not okay. You keep up with the sinful lifestyle and you and others will remember the difficulties. In some cases, you'll actually be assigned to other people to stay clear. You ever heard the old statement, stand back because lightning is going to strike? Anybody ever heard that? Stand back. They're going to get struck by lightning. You become a testimony that God will not condone sin and unfaithfulness. Sometimes you're punished so other people don't have to go through what you're going through. Sometimes you're chastened to the point where others recognize it. You may be asking tonight, in what way would this manifest itself? In what way would we see this? In what way would we be able to notice this? Look around. You know the answer to this. Look around. How about being arrested? How about being in an accident? How about having drug and alcohol problems? How about having financial issues? How about sickness? Do I need to go on in this awful list? Or do you guys got the point here? That you can be used as an example so others don't continue in the path right along with you. I've learned. I've learned that saying you are sorry isn't enough. You see, saying sorry is just a cop-out. Actually, what you're saying is that you're feeling sorry for yourself. You're feeling sorry for yourself. If you want to do what is right, then you seek forgiveness. You seek repentance. Because when you do that, you own your sin. You become accountable for what you've done. 
And accountability is the number one issue of mankind today. They don't want to be accountable for themselves. You don't blame it on anyone else. You don't blame it on situations around you. You don't blame it on environmental. You don't even blame it on any other thing. You stand up and you say, yup, I did it, and, and I shouldn't have done it. And, Lord, I, I, I am repenting uh, from the heart. I'm not, asking for your, I'm not asking for you to feel sorry for me. Lord, I feel sorry for myself, but I don't want to do it again. Lord, my heart is aimed at you. Lord, I, I don't know what you want me to do or what I need to do to correct it, but whatever. Whatever you say or whatever you do, I'm going to do it. You don't sugarcoat it. You stand up and you accept it. And you don't minimize it. You know that you've done wrong things and you want to get it right again. Honesty is where you begin to turn around. See, you have to begin to be honest with yourself. Because if you can't be honest with yourself, you can't be honest with others or with God. You're only going to be trying to fool everybody around you. You're only going to be able to, you're really trying to fool everyone around you. Look at this next statement that Ezekiel says. He says, the strangers who sojourn in Israel. What's so special about this statement? It looks so common, right? The strangers who sojourn in Israel. A believer, let me, let me show you something. I love that statement, look at the mirror, because the only person you can change is yourself. Amen, Juniper. The only person you can change is yourself. A believer impacts non-believers. Whether you know it or not, a believer impacts non-believers. When you're a believer... And you are doing things contrary to God's will and hanging out with non-believers. Our holy God holds them responsible for the actions also. You're probably thinking, well, what do you mean, pastor? How can I be responsible for someone else's actions? Let me, let me put this in example for you. you. You are a believer. Go and use drugs. You should know that God is not going to let you get away with this act because you are his child. You will experience his chastisement. If you are with a group of non-believers, they will experience being caught with you by the police or harmed or something worse. These non-believers are held responsible for the truth. We might say, hey, that is too harsh. That's too harsh. We can't be done that way. But look at what the well, look at what God says in the book of Leviticus chapter 20. See a lot of people they don't like the Old Testament. Oh, the Old Testament is not relevant. The Old Testament it doesn't matter. Our God is the same yesterday, today and forever. Let me repeat that for you. Our God is the same yesterday, today and forever. He is unchanging. Look at what Leviticus chapter 20 says. Look at this. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man, and I will cut him off from his people, because he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man when he gives some of his descendants to Molech and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit idolatry to Molech and the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. People. If you think that you are not an example to someone else and you think that you're not going to be held accountable as a believer of God when you're leading others astray, I am sorry for you, but you have some punishment coming. 
The Bible says, and Jesus says, it's, it's best that you put a millstone around your neck and cast yourself in the sea rather than do any harm to one of my little children. That's a powerful statement. If you don't know what a millstone is, it's a giant piece of like concrete that they used to use to smash the wheat and the barley on. And, a, and a, a mul mules would pull this thing in a circle. It was a heavy piece of concrete or stone. And it would be better for you to cast yourself into the sea with that around your neck than you to lead one of his children astray. I don't care if you like it tonight. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm here to bring you the truth of the gospel. Look at verse 9 and 10. It says, and if the prophet is induced to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people Israel. And they shall bear their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired. Another way to look at verse 9 would be this. I want you to look at it this way because it helped me to understand it. And hopefully it will help you understand it. Welcome in, Brad. God bless you. And if the prophet is deceived and speaks a word, I, Yahweh, have deceived that prophet. Wow. Wow. Do you see what the Lord is saying here? Let me read it again. Let me read it again so maybe you got it. And if the prophet is deceived and speaks a word, I, Yahweh, I, God, have deceived that prophet. Do you see what the Lord is saying? If people continue to persist in idolatry, then our God will give them up to his, this useless pursuit. He's going to actually provide the people with false prophets who will continue to deceive them. They will get the teachers that they deserve. It's kind of like America who keeps rejecting God. Right? It's like America who keeps rejecting God. He's given us the evil, corrupt leaders that we deserve. You see it in churches. You see it in the communities. You see it in the states. And you see it nationwide. If you don't want his pure word, then you'll get what you bargained for. Worthless public speakers. The end result is death and destruction. You see, the numbers in this live are small. Go to the ones that are, that are patting you on the back and giving you an ear-tickling message and see how large those lives are. I thank God for the people that want the real word. I thank God for the ones that actually want to receive truth. I thank God for those that love God with all their heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. I thank God for those that are seeking the kingdom and not seeking earthly riches. See, we see, though, a balance here. We see a balance here. Both the false prophet and the individual are intertwined. Because the preacher is not only held responsible for his message. Now watch this. Because you see all these fake messages out here on TikTok. You see all these motivational speakers on TV that call themselves pastors Joel Osteen. You see all these people that are not teaching the gospel. They're not teaching the word of God. And it's not only those that are held responsible but it's also the recipient of the messages held liable for the truth, whether fed the correct information or not. That's pretty scary, right? That's pretty scary, right? Because it's not just the pastor or the motivational speaker that's going to be in trouble. It's all those that are listening to it and accepting it as truth. So continue to listen to that nonsense. Thinking that, oh, well, I've got an excuse if this isn't right. No, you ain't got no excuse. You accepted it as truth. Look at verse 11. 
Look at verse 11. It says that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me nor be profaned anymore with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people and I may be their God, says the Lord God. If you've ever watched animal adventure films, you've probably watched a mother animal, such as a bird or a fish, display to its young the lessons of survival of stalking prey. Have you ever, guys ever seen a video of an, an, um, an eagle? How the, the mama bird is showing them how to swoop down into the, to the lake or the river and grab that fish with the talons and take it away. It's sometimes cute to see the young uh, animal pretend to act out a stalking technique such as a, a lion. Have you ever seen a, a mother lion teaching the lion cub or the tiger teaching the tiger cub? And you can see the little the little uh, cub like getting down in the stalking stance and he's trying to look intimidating like the mom is doing. And they're pretending to pounce on an unsuspecting victim, right? And usually when they're doing this, they, they're, they're using another sibling to do this, right? We see here our loving Lord give a description of a benefit even for horrible conditions. God's teaching for his children was so that they could see and learn from the judgments in order to stop doing what was wrong and return to him. Where do you think the animals gets the instincts from? Who taught the animals how to do that? Who taught the moms in this chat tonight how to be a mom? Who taught the dads in here how to be a dad? Some of you might not have had a mom or a dad in your picture, and they weren't the best of examples if you did. Who taught you? God was doing this so that he could teach his children so that they would return to him. Look at 12 through 14. He says, the word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when a land sins against me by my persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread, send famine on it, and cut off man and beast from it. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. We see here, beginning in verse 12, a new word of instruction from God. And I really hope you guys are taking notes. You see a new word of instruction from God tonight. We see back in the book of Genesis chapter 18 that God was holding back judgment because of the condition of having a righteous man in its midst. You guys realize that, right? In Genesis chapter 18, God was holding back judgment because of the condition of having one righteous man in its midst. Do you guys remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Do you remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? And he came to God and he said, God, if there's a, a hundred righteous, will you save the city? If there's 50 righteous, will you save the city? If there's 30 righteous, will you, will you save the city? If there's 10 righteous, will you save the city? There was only the one family that was found righteous. And in that family, one of them turned back. You guys understand that, right? Lot was the only one found righteous. Let's read from 16. In chapter 18, let's start in verse 16. Come on. Then the men rose up from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, 
and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Look at verse 26. He says, So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the places for their sake. Then Abram answered and said, Indeed, now I am but dust and ashes, have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than 50 righteous. Would you destroy all the city for lack of five? So he said, If I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there would be 40 found there. You see how you, you see how Abraham was like bargaining bargaining with God. He said, "If I find there forty five, I'll not destroy." And he spoke again and said, "Suppose there's only forty found there." So he said, "I'll not do it for the sake of forty. Then he said, "Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty should be found there." So he said, "I will not do it if I find thirty. And he said, indeed, now I have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry again. Hey, God, don't be angry again. Don't be angry, but um, what about 10? Suppose 10 be found there, Lord. And he said, I'll not destroy it for the sake of 10. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. You see, there was only one man found righteous in Sodom, Lot. The times for the righteous deferring judgment was past even if righteous men were around or involved. Now we are declared righteous because of the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. His righteousness has been imparted to us believers by his sacrifice on the cross. You would think the list of righteous men would include Abraham, Joshua, or David, just to name a few. But did you know they're left out of this list? Did you know that they're left out of this list? Moses and Samuel are spoken well by our precious Holy Spirit in Jeremiah chapter 15. In Jeremiah chapter 15, it says, Then the Lord said to me, Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. Only Daniel, Job, and Noah make God's special list of recognition. Daniel, Job, and Noah make God's list of special recognition. Look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. It says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. Look at Job 1, 1. Job 1, 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. For 120 years, Noah witnessed to others by his persistent obedience in building the ark. Yet at the end of his project, judgment came upon evil mankind. Job was well known and respected by past and future generations, yet he still experienced suffering. The mention of Daniel is even more interesting in that he was probably alive during this time. The mention of a current hero like Daniel is especially impacting to the Jews of this time period. And the national celebrity Daniel was not spared the experience of judgment as he went through terrible hardships of war. Do you guys see this? Even the ones that were found righteous in God's eyes still experienced hardships and trials. Do you think you're going to escape any hardships or trials? Look at 15 and 16. 
It says, if I cause wild beasts to pass through the land and they empty it and make it so desolate that no man may pass through it because of the beast, even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they should deliver neither sons nor daughters. Only they would be delivered and the land would be desolate. A land that was once populated and ceases to exist reverts back to its original position. Look at South America. Look at South America. The Incas were a mighty group of inhabitants. Yet because of invaders from Europe came and destroyed this empire, the jungles have reclaimed this territory. It took many exploratory expeditions to discover the Inca ruins. Here we see that a nation that is destroyed and some of the results, wild animals take over the area. The situation does not just happen overnight, but displays a long time frame of destruction to the primeval condition. Daniel didn't have any children. You guys re realize that Daniel didn't have any children because it says that he was probably made a eunuch as we read in Daniel chapter 1. We read that the three godly men would be spared but not their children. Noah's children were spared in the flood. Lot's children were all killed by Satan's influence. Guys, this is, this is important information. Verses 17 and 18, it says, Or if I bring a sword on that land and say, Sword, go through the land, and I cut off man and beast from it, even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver, deliver neither sons nor daughters, but only they themselves would be delivered. The Lord is kicking it up here. The Lord is kicking his wrath up here. He's done with them. He's done playing games. He's done trying to get them back. He's got to show them who's in charge. So he's kicking it up a notch in the devastation. It's about the same effect as a nuclear bomb. Everything, including anything living, would be destroyed. Now that's total judgment. That's total judgment. That's how bad the situation was and how our Holy Lord felt about the ultimate effects of what they were doing. Guys, we're looking at what Israel was doing, but what are we doing? And people think there's not judgment coming. Oh, you guys have lost your ever-loving mind if you think judgment ain't coming. Look at 19 and 20. 19 and 20. It says, Or if I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury on it in blood and cut off from it man and beast, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. Remember that when twice our God mentions something, it's done to bring his readers the seriousness of the action. When you see repetition of something being said, there's something that you better grab a hold of because it's of importance. It seems as these verses are the same, but they're not. We see now the additional effects of war, pestilence. When you have a bunch of dead bodies lying around, then disease sets in. Our Lord had pointed out the horror to his people who walked away from him and sought out demonic gods to follow in Leviticus chapter 26. In Leviticus chapter 26, it talks about how he's going to chastise them seven times for their sins. It says that you'll eat the flesh of your sons and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. He that he's going to destroy the high places. He talks about as long as it lies desolate, it shall rest for the time it did not rest on your Sabbath when you dwelt in it. He totally obliterated them because they denied and defiled everything that he had given them. 
Go read Leviticus 26 after this. And look how it lines up with what God's doing in Ezekiel 14. Look at verses 21 through 23. It says, for thus says the Lord God, how much more shall it be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem, the sword and famine and wild beast and pestilence to cut off man and beast from it. Yet behold, there shall be left in it a remnant who will be brought out, both sons and daughters. Surely they will come out to you and you will see their ways and their doings. Then you'll be confronted concerning the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem, all that I have brought upon it, and they will comfort you when you see their ways and their doings, and you shall know that I have done nothing without cause, that I have done it, done in it, says the Lord God. There, there, there's four horrors of war described in verse 21. Now, if you're taking notes, this is a place you'd want to take notes. Because it says the sword and famine and wild beasts and pestilence. The sword refers to deaths caused by war. The sword refers to deaths caused by war. The famine results from all crops, trees, and animals being destroyed. The famine results from all crops, trees, and animals being destroyed. The wild beast, as described before, take over what is left vacant. The wild beasts are going to run rampant. And lastly, disease runs rampant from death and decay because of all the bodies left there to decay and die. But see, there's comfort that we can take from this chapter. You're probably thinking, well, Pastor, you've, you've laid it all out on the table and I feel awful tonight. I feel awful for these people. You should be feeling awful for yourself because we're in the same predicament Israel was in. The sword, the sword refers to the deaths caused by war. The deaths caused by war. But see, there's comfort. There's comfort that we can take from this tonight. Some of you may never come back to this live, and that's fine. If you can't handle the truth, this probably isn't the live for you. But there's some comfort in this because from all these awful descriptions that we've seen tonight in Ezekiel 14, it's about our Lord's mercy. When you read Leviticus chapter 26, it reveals that our Lord is quick to restore. The people will be able to take encouragement that the Lord is righteous in his judgment and loving in his ultimate reestablishment, reestablishment of new relationships with people. Our God is righteous, holy, and loving. Righteous, holy, and loving. But sin will not go unpunished. But our God is quick to restore. He's quick to restore when we turn from our wicked ways and we return back to him.